Again, we'd like to welcome you to our final class of the day and I'd like to thank Nancy for her coming on and helping us out with family history and, uh, and ancestry in particular. And I'll stop my screen share now and that she can begin to screen share. All right, well, welcome to the webinar this afternoon. I have got on the screen showing you the link that I put in chat to my website where you can get the handout. It's nancybusbyfamilyhistory.com. And if you scroll down, when it opens up, if you scroll down to the tab that says, the button that says place name searches April 2023, if you click on that, you can download the handout. I just wanted to make sure you know how to do that. It's a question we often get. So um, today I'm going to be talking about doing searches using place names primarily. And, often in combination with a, with a surname for a family, but um, we'll, we'll take a look at that. Um, the, first, the first one that I want to go over is a case study that shows you an example of a time where I couldn't find an immigration record and some strategies and things that I did to, um, to try to, to, to find that record. So um, this family that I was working with, their last name was Kasperowitz. And I knew from, from the family records that I had access to that they, they had immigrated to, um, to the United States and came into port in New York City in 1853. But the, in, in all the records that I, that I had seen that the family had, I was help, helping out a friend actually on this one. Um, they they didn't have any reference to to their immigration record, and and I thought, well, gosh, that that ought to be fairly easy to find, right? We know where they came in, we know about what year. So um, when I would, but when I would put in in a search for you know using their last name and the arrival location and the year, nothing would come up. So I'm just going to go over a couple of things that I knew about this family that, that helped me figure this out. So here is the 1855 New York State Census. And I could see that the family had was, was living in New York at this time. And um, this, this went along with the, with the information that I knew that they had, they had immigrated in 1853. Um, Here's the father, Sigmund Kasparitz, and his wife, listed as Adelies, and she was also known as she was also known as um, as Teresa. But on on the census here, it had Adelies as her name, and their children, Millard, Powell, Samuel, Charles, and Humboldt. And Humboldt says he's one years old, and he was born in New York. So that was. Um, that was interesting. And also on this New York state census, there was a column that told me the years that they had resided, um, that they were residents of the city where this, where this was, uh, where this census took place. And most of the family had been there for two years and then the baby had been there for one year. So, um, so th those are some of the things that I knew about them. And um, so we also, didn't have any birth record for this youngest child, Humboldt, in the in the state of New York, and we it was a record that I felt like we we really ought to have been able to find, but you know there there wasn't anything out there. And then I also could see that the family was here in the 1860 census, and this just shows an example of how sometimes the information on a census can. Um, can be a little bit misleading, but always it gives you some good clues, right? So when I looked at this youngest child, again, Humboldt, it says that he's seven years old now. Well, he was one year old in the 1955 census, five years old, earlier. So, you know, depending on what month he was born, I guess that could be, but um, just simple math might tell you that that was a year off, but but anyway, they, it, it lists the family, and, and now the wife's name is Teresa, as I was accustomed to seeing it, and, and then they've had another, another child, Augusta, who's three months old. 
so th this, these are the kinds of things that I'm that I'm figuring out about this family as I kind of move through the records that we that we could find. And um, so so here I am on the the Hamburg passenger list site in Ancestry. And Hamburg, Germany is where um, a lot of a lot of the ships departed from on their way to to New York. So on the Hamburg passenger list, I typed in their, their surname and put the place where they had arrived and the year that I believe they had um, departed in from, from Germany and then arrived in the United States, 1853. And the results that came up in Ancestry gave me all of these, these years that I was looking through for a departure in, in Hamburg and arriving in New York. But none of these were matching up, and, and also using that, that last name, Kasperowitz. But none of these names or years were matching up with, with anyone in the family and the time frame when I believed they had, they had arrived. And so that was turning into what looked like to be a bit of a dead end. So I, I decided to take this, this son's name that was born in New York and put his name in and just, I just did it. I actually did a Google search using his name. And I, so I typed in his name, Humboldt Kasperowitz, New York, just to see what generally would come up. Cause I, I was also hoping to find a, a birth record of some kind for him as well. And one of the results that came up was a portrait of the Jews in Wilmington, North Carolina, where he was listed with his brother, Charles, um, and, his, and it also listed his first name as being Henry. And I could see that they were, they were mentioned in this, in this document. And so when I went to that and looked up their names in this document, I learned something that, that I didn't know and that the family who had shared their information with me also didn't know. And it, let me know that the name Humboldt came from a German vessel the family had boarded to immigrate to the United States in 1853, rather than from the explorer. So it kind of clarified where this child had gotten his name. And so I was like, aha, now I have an idea of what the name of the ship they came in on was. And that was information that we didn't have before. So when I now, when I went back to do it, do a search, I just put in the arrival location, New York City, and the departure in 1853, again from Hamburg, Germany. And this time I was able to add in the name of the ship, Humboldt. When I typed this in, it gave me a list of all the passengers that were on that ship in 1853. So I'm scrolling through all of the, the surnames and I find the name, Kasparovich listed, spelled with a C and um, slightly different different spelling throughout the name. And I thought, well, I think this might be them. But this is the closest we've ever gotten to finding something. So I clicked on the little image icon. And that took me to the, the passenger list for Hamburg um, for that ship as it was departing from Germany. And it listed um, S. Kas Kasparovich, or what I knew them as was, was Kasperwich, um, or Kasperwich, uh, and this this kind of helped me see that this was the right the right family. And actually, if you if you look at the little tiny print, it lists some of the other family members here too, and it tells who the captain of the ship was. So that was that was great to to uh, kind of nail down documentation of, of the head of the house and his family coming over in July of 1853. So then I decided, okay, I'm going, going to now turn to the, the arriving passenger list for New York, New York City um, for Castle Garden and Ellis Island. So I put the search in, um, spelling it with a C this time, with this new spelling that I didn't know about or hadn't thought about trying to use before. Um, and put the arrival in 1853, New York City, um, departing from Hamburg and the ship name Humboldt. And I got five results 
all on a all on a different ship with the same, you know, similar spelling with the C, Kasparovic. And and I thought, oh, well, we still don't have their, their arrival date and they're not listing the right boat. So then I went back to the search engine again. This time I took out the last name. I was like, I just want to see this ship, the ship's manifest that came in in 1853 into New York City from Germany on this specific ship's name. So I completely removed the surname. Um, this time I was able to see that the family was listed with yet another unique spelling, um, Carperwelly. And I don't think that anyone um, that anyone had ever thought about looking this family up under, under that spelling of this name. And I, I really only stumbled across it by doing a little sleuthing uh, through, through discovering what the name of the ship they came in on and um, using the names of the family that I did know. And, um, and the, 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 the son that's listed that you can see here, Mandime, that, that is the son that I knew on the family group records as Millard or Millard. Um, so anyway, I was pretty excited to see this. We could see that they arrived in September. So I know now that the, the uh, ship traveled from July through September to get to the United States. And I clicked on the image to take a look at the family and I could see the family here. It lists Simon and Teresa and Mannheim, Paul, Saul, and Carl, which is another variation of, of Charles, right? And um, so I'm like, okay, this, this is definitely the family. I've got all the, all the names with slightly varying spellings, but but this this is matching up pretty good. So, so Simon Caparelli Caparelli turned out to be the Sigmund Kasperwitz I was looking for. And here's the transcript that I could see about the information that was on the original record from Ancestry, listing all those dates and places. And um, I want to point out here that. We're on page seven of nine, and I remembered that in the in the the uh, the the copy of the book that I found online, it commented that the this youngest son Humboldt Henry Humboldt was named named after the ship that they they came on, and I I wondered if he was if he was possibly born on the ship or not. So I actually looked through all of the pages on the ship manifest, which was only nine pages in this case. And on the last page, it said one child born on the voyage. And even though it didn't list the name of the individual, this, this gave me a pretty strong clue that he was not born in New York and was actually born on the ship as they traveled. And this was this explained why we weren't able to find, find a birth record for him when we did for the younger children that were born after they arrived in the United States. So it's always good to look at look at multiple pages on, on, a, on an original record when you find it, and not just the one page that has the one name or the one family that you're looking at. And this just kind of wraps up where we find Henry at the end of his life in Ohio. So, there's, there's a lot to be told about Henry and his birth and going to New York and then eventually finding himself in North Carolina and, and then um, passing away in Ohio. So he, he had quite, quite the life and it was exciting to find a little more information about him, um, starting with just, just some place name searches and ship names and trying to look for unique names within the family to, to utilize to aid in that search. Okay, the next case study that I want to do is um, finding a family by searching in cemeteries. I'm using this example going from find a grave, and um, the person that I'm that I'm looking for here, his surname is Dempsey, and I knew that he was born in Floyd County, Georgia, and he passed away in Calhoun, Alabama. So 
I, I kind of had an idea, you know, from other family records and whatnot that this Dempsey family found that they, the city they lived in, the county was right on the border of Alabama. And so the family, sometimes they were in Georgia and some census records and some marriage records, and sometimes they were in Alabama. And, and so I wanted to um, do kind of a, a thorough search of, of the county with this surname and see if I could find any other family members who we didn't have death records for. So I, I did this by using the surname and just typing into the search Calhoun County, Alabama. And when, when you do that, it's going, it, it's going to bring up all of the cemeteries in that county. And depending on the, the size of the county or the surname that you're, that you're working with, you might have a manageable amount of things to search through or, um, or you might not have a manageable, but it's always good, I think, to give this a try and see what comes up and you can kind of scroll down through and you can sort by cemetery so that you can group the surname surnames that were buried in one cemetery versus another. Um, and that, that kind of helps as you scroll through, well, how many, how many family members are here? How many were in another one? And then um, go to the map, go to maps and take a look at where they're located in relation to where you know your family was living. And um, by, do, by doing this, I was able to find, find the cemetery records for some of the family members that I didn't necessarily have um, recorded in my family history. And there are other ways to sort. There are many ways to sort. You could sort by date, um, death date. You can even sort by birth date or by, or by name. Um, but we, since we're just searching one, one surname in this case, that's already a given, right? So um, this is one way to take a look at, um, at the surrounding cemeteries in an area uh, instead of just the one or two cemeteries in the town where you think they passed away. Um, you never know where, where someone's body is going to be interred. And so I, I found it very helpful to, to take a look at that and see if I could find some other places. And um, one of the people I ran across here was um, in the Edgemont Cemetery in Anniston. And his name is Jesse Franklin Dempsey. And there were some dates that I didn't have for him that I was able to add, add to my, to my uh, repertoire of family history. And when I clicked on his name, it took me to, to his person page within Find a Grave. And here it gave me information about his spouse who his parents are, and also his siblings. So I was able to, just by clicking on one person, one name that I knew, um, kind of check everything that was in, that had been entered into find a grave against the family records that we had and see if there was more information that I could glean and gather from them. And, and another thing that I could do at that point is over here on the right, I can go to back to just that cemetery or to that city or to that county again um, and get back to where I was. You know, you can also click the back button, but um, if you want to just, just explore the people in, in that specific cemetery, I just would click on Edgemont Cemetery over here on the right, and that would bring up all of the Dempsey's again in that cemetery. And, and you can go in and edit your search and add initials or first names if there are other specific people you want to try to find. But it's a, it's a great place to start to throw out, cast kind of a broad net for a surname in a specific location. So here I am at the Edgemont Cemetery um, front page and I type in Dempsey so I can get the search for, for that if I hadn't already been where I was. You could do this with any cemetery, go to the search criteria and just put in the surname. Um, Another thing you can do is um, an individual, uh, like a, a wife, who when it lists their, their maiden name, you could also go back to your search and just put in that maiden name and see if her parents and siblings could be possibly buried there too, or in surrounding, surrounding cemeteries in the same area. Now I would like to go over some, some things that I was able to find using newspapers.com. Kind of hopefully 
spark some some ideas as you think about your family tree, some of the people and places that you have been looking. Um, it might give you some ideas. So when you are physically at the BYU library, Family History Library, you have access to newspapers.com. Um, they have the full membership available there. Um, you can purchase a membership uh, so you can access it from home also if you prefer. But uh, you can, if you if you don't live close to Provo, if you're somewhere far flung out there in the world, another option is to go to a local local public library or a family search center. Um, you can do a search online for family search centers near you. Um, they they might have memberships available to this, and you could always call and find out if they have it. But even if you decide you want to purchase the membership yourself. When you go to newspapers.com, it's going to take you to a page, and I like to sometimes scroll down to search by location. Um, and one of the reasons I do that is because not every little city, town, or hamlet has has a has a newspaper that's necessarily recorded, and and so sometimes the the news and events of of several towns or cities are going to be found in in a in a like in a county paper or a, a paper that covers a certain region of a, of a state or a county, and so I like to just kind of see generally what's out there. So I'll I'm going to in this clip case I would click on Virginia because that's the state that I know I want to go look at. And after you click on that, it's going to bring up a list of the different cities that that they have records for newspapers. And so you can then select a city if you want to, or you can take a look at the map. So over here on the top left, there are two tabs, browse and map. So if I click on map, that's going to take me back out to a map of the world. And here I can see there are a little over 2000 possibilities in this, in this area. And and that that's that's kind of what your your forty five thousand foot view, right? <clears throat> so you want to zoom in on that and hone in on the the specific cities and county of the area where your ancestor lived. And you're going to start seeing these little little map tags um, populated on the map. And some of them are going to have a little number that tells you how many different newspapers were associated with that specific area. Or if there's no number, there probably was just one, or you might need to zoom in even tighter to see what those numbers are. So I want to zoom in tight to this little town. And once I get, get close enough to it, I can click on that. And I can view the different newspapers that were around in that county that they have records for. And so in this case, I've got a surname that I want to look for, but I kind of started with the with the map and the locations where I know they were living. And I'm going to start with the Staunton Spectator. So when I click on that, it brings me to a page that is going to search any of the archives for that particular newspaper. And um, I can, I can uh, narrow it down by date if I want to. I can browse the archive by date. I can also scroll down and take a look at other nearby newspapers. If I exhaust this resource and I want to look at other things, there are several different different options here. But um, in this case, I go ahead and type a surname in, Hannah, to see what I can find in this particular newspaper in the area where I know this family lived. Okay, so once I once you you click on that that search criteria, you've got some other options that you can use to narrow down your search if you want to or need to add a date range so that you can narrow narrow the search to just a time frame where you know they they probably likely lived in the area you can go ahead and edit that search and add that in you can also add a more specific location if you want to and there are other filters that you can check out but over here on the top left it tells me that i have 210 matches for hannah in this one paper that i'm searching and it gives you a preview of the of the article and it highlights the name which is always really helpful to as you're scrolling up and down you can you can kind of 
pr pretty quickly kind of run through and see if if any names that you know of are popping out at you. Um, and then it also tells you what page it's on and which issue of the, you know, the date that that particular newspaper was from. And so this is another way that you can sort through the, the date ranges. Um, if you don't put a date range in, you can also um, have it sort by date, um, these results. So over here on the right, I can see the map that I'm in Virginia and, and it's showing me the different matches within these different decades. So in the 1890s, there are 82 matches. In the 1880s, there are 81. In the 70s, there are 33. So I could click on any of these and just, just take a look at a specific decade. There's a particular person and time frame I'm looking for. Um, and I already went over that you can, you can add more information into the search at the top. Uh, by changing the date range up there too, or getting more specific with a different location. Um, explore the different sort criteria and categories that are there in the filters, if that helps you narrow down your search if you have too many results. And we've got our 210. And right now I've got the Staunton Spectator. So I wanna click on that and take a look at on page three of this one. So when you click on the actual article, um, you want to make sure you take a look at and notice that it's telling me there are one, that we're looking at one of nine matches on this page of this newspaper. So that lets me know that the name Hannah is showing up nine times um, from what, what they're able to find. And so I don't want to only look at this, at this entry. I want to make sure I zoom out and kind of pan around the page and find the other highlights of the name and see if there are other family members it talks about. But this one that I decided to click on, I learned something new about this, this person, that he had a his barn burned down and, um, and there were some horses and, and some mules that belonged to a party and a group who had stopped by their house for the night to spend the night. And, um, and in trying to save his barn once he was alerted to the fire, uh, he, he was scorched in his face trying to rescue his horses. And it tells about the property loss. So um, newspapers are a really fun way to learn little details about the lives of your ancestors. And I will often go to newspapers.com when I'm researching a specific branch of my tree and just see if there's anything out there in the area with their surname. So I'll start with the location I know they were living and then pop in their surname, just like I showed you here, and just kind of start scrolling through and seeing if there are any interesting tidbits of information that I can learn about the family. Um, and some, oftentimes there's, there's nothing there at all, but I will tell you that it's always worth the search for me because when I do hit on a, on an area where the family was was actively being reported on and what what they were doing in their lives and what was going on, it will it will have um, often birth announcements. It will have marriage and death obituaries. Um, also, like social calendars of you know, Mr. Jones's parents were in town visiting for a week from Timbuktu, and you you just kind of learn little snippets of their lives. So I always like, like using this information. So this was in 1896 in March. And when I, when I zoomed out to look at, see what those other matches are, I could see that it took me to, to more information about the article. So there was a little, a little bit of a snippet about the information. When I zoom out, I can see the full article. And I learned that in less than an hour, there were at least a hundred men, women, and children on the ground helping to try to put the fire out. I imagine they were they were scooping up water from whatever the closest water source was and passing the buckets along and trying to trying to help put out that fire. Um, and then when I when I looked at another article in the same same time frame. I'm, I've forwarded to, to June now, June of 1896. Here's another, um, another uh, young man, Eugene Hanna. He was a, a little boy, about three, three years old at the time. 
And I learned that he was a, he was called the Little Prince and he won immortal renown by singing, singing a solo in the choir. And that was, that was kind of a fun, fun little thing to learn about this little boy. Um, John is asking a question in the, in the, um, in the comments. How do you copy the article for reference? Um, there are a couple of ways to do it. Up, up here on the right on this page, you can see there is a clip option and you can um, do a virtual clip of these articles. And when you clip the article, it allows you to highlight and draw throughout. The, you can see this little blue outline. You can uh, adjust that to whatever size you want it to be to encompass the whole article or just a portion of it and clip the article. And then when you're logged in, like I am here um, with my login email, um, it's going to save those clips to my newspapers.com account. And with your Ancestry account, I could, I could also choose to click on Save to Ancestry, and it will save the link to this article in, into my Ancestry tree. And I can select the individual that it belongs to and add, add this, this as a source directly into my Ancestry tree from newspapers. That's one of the benefits of um, Ancestry owning newspapers.com is they do have the ability to, to link into that. You can also um, just print or download directly from, from the article when you bring it up. I'll use this option if I'm at a library where um, I might not be logged in. Like if I don't have a personal account, I might use that option to download or print the article and then save it on a flash drive. And then I can manually upload it to my tree in whatever program I'm using. Um, and use that as a source too. And, and then I can also, um, you can take a screenshot of the, of the actual article so you have a, an image of it. Those are a few different ways. Um, and then there's also a question here about the handout. Um, the handout is, is at a link um, that is in the chat, nancybusbyfamilyhistory.com. And We'll just take a moment and pull that, that website over. So when you click on that link, it's going to take you here to my website under the Ancestry tab. Scroll down to place name searches. And when you click on that, it's going to open the PDF. And that is your handout. It's, it shows all of the slides. And it looks like um, Elder Anderton put the link in again. Thank you. So you can, you can access all of the slide decks from there for the handout. We'll talk about that at the beginning too to try to catch everybody. So then I also looked at a one of the other matches that was on this page, and I see that Mr. Henry Hanna of Mount Salon is building a barn. Well, I know that he needs to build a barn because I know that a few months earlier his barn burnt down. But kind of fun to see that he was picking up and moving on and and getting to work, putting his barn up again. Interesting things I never would have known other than finding this. Um, this article is, uh, you might recognize that last name that comes up, Busby. That is my dad. After finding all of this cool stuff about my friend's ancestor from the Hannah family, I thought, well, I want to see if there's anything on my family. So I put, um, I was born in California. And so I put, I, I, went to the location where, where my family lived and put in my last name to see if there were any articles about my parents or grandparents or brothers and sisters. And I found this article advertising that my dad was going to be teaching a class in Azusa, California to the genealogical members there. So um, I, I knew from finding this article that I that I come by this, this honestly. I, I definitely was exposed to to the um, genealogy and family history bug for my parents. And it was fun to see that my dad was out there teaching classes and feel like I'm following in his footsteps. So that's kind of fun. So you don't have to reach so far back into history to find newspaper articles. Don't forget about your, your family who's a little closer um, to you too. You might find out things that you didn't know about them. All right, um, on, on this section, I want to show you the family search wiki because it's such a great location finder resource. When I when I decide to dive in and, and do some research on a specific family, I don't 
I don't always know what all the resources are that are available out there. And how could any one of us really accumulate and gather that information? If you haven't used the Family Search Wiki before, um, I highly recommend it so that you know what kinds of records are available out there for you to even begin searching for. So when you go to the main page, it's going to take you to a map of the world and you can click on whatever region of the world you want to or need to do research for. And in this example, I'll click on North America and I select the United States and I want to go see Connecticut. So I click on the state and location that I want to see. And from here, I can, I can pretty, pretty quickly scroll up and down and see all over on the right hand side is just a quick list, right? You've got different guides for doing research, the record types that are available in the state of Connecticut, a little bit of background on the biography, maps, the history, um, and and lots of different information you can find there. So I'm gonna pull over over the kind of the live website here. So here I am um, in New Haven Co County. This is where I grew up. Um, so I, I thought it would be fun to take a look at what's what's available there. And I, as you can see, as you scroll up and down, once you kind of zoom in on, you know, going from Connecticut to a specific county where, where um, I might want to do research, I've got a list of contents that, that gives you a quick, a quick look and links to hop within the page to any of these things. But I can really quickly get an overview of the kinds of records that are available in the locale that I want to search. There, you're going to see things like maps. It's going to give you the lists of cities and communities, um, the towns that were organized before 1800, um, so that you know, well, why aren't I finding the name of the city? Well, maybe it didn't exist yet. Um, there, in this case, you've got links to Bible records. And because this is a wiki, it is um, being updated by participants who know information and they, they're signed in to be able to add information and edit information, keep it as up to date as possible. Um, I'm just scrolling through their military records and natural things about World War I registration cards and World War II, naturalization and citizenship. There are so many different, different things I can find. I can take a look at obituaries for the county, um, tax records, school records, all the, the main vital records that you might wanna see. Um, so th this is almost everything you would wanna know about a lo locale. And I'm scrolling all the way to the bottom. I can see here that this page was last edited on the 4th of April, 2023. So um, one thing that I that I love about this that's really reliable is that people are constantly updating it, adding to, to this wiki. So if you haven't, haven't utilized this in, in um, understanding which types of records are available in the locations you need to search for, um, definitely, definitely take a look there. All right, the next item that I wanna go over is using Family Search Catalog. I can't not go here because because this presentation is specifically about searching by place name, and I use place name on searching the catalog often. When you go to do a search in the catalog, you're going to get several different options. You can put in the place, surname, titles, the um, an author, subjects, or even keywords. Um, this is where you can also go to enter a film number if you have a reference. Sometimes when I'm in Ancestry, because Ancestry and Family Search are cooperating with many of their records, sometimes on Ancestry it will give a reference to a um, to a Family Search film number, and this is where you can go um, to look up that actual film number if you want to take a look at the original images. So um, you would just click on film number if you wanted to do that. But in this case, I want to take a look at a place. So I'm going to type in Floyd County. Um, I'm looking for Floyd County, Georgia. So I start typing in Floyd and it brings me these, these options. So I select the one I want. And once I go to Floyd County, Georgia, 
Here I can see all of the different records that are in the Family Search catalog for that county. And it tells me how many different um, categories have, have records that I can look at. So court records has 18, for instance. Um, many of these have one, you know, between one and 10. Um, there are probate records, naturalization, military records for the Civil War, um, genealogies, guardianship records, histories, Bible records. So from here, you can get a really quick snapshot. What are the kinds of records that Family has, Family Search has out there? And one of the keys for this is to recognize that many of these records have not been indexed. And so by just typing a general search in their search engine, it's not going to bring up these kinds of records um, for the ones that have not been indexed. So I, I always want to take a look at what's in the catalog outside of the hints that are being given to me from the index records. So I scrolled down to the poor and common school records. And the reason I wanted to look at this is because one of my ancestors, um, Berryman Shoemake Dempsey, my mom had a really poor photocopy of a, uh, he was a, um, like a school commissioner for the, for the uh, local school. And she had a really poor old photocopy that she had done in the 1970s that I had a copy of, that it was hard to read. And I thought, well, she probably got this record from, from, you know, from, a, from an image catalog somewhere. And so I wanted to see if I could find, find his record. And it wasn't indexed. And so I did have to search page by page by page, just scanning, scanning, looking for his name. So you, you've got a little bit of old school research that you've got to do when you're, uh, when you're utilizing this, but it can, it can be very rewarding. So I want to show you a few of the things that I found besides my um, third, third or fourth great grandfather's name. So I went there looking for one thing and walked away with dozens of, of names and people and information. Because as I'm scrolling through, I'm looking for the surname Dempsey in this location. And I started seeing things like, oh, here's Levi Dempsey, his children, um, Andy and Winnie were enrolled in in the, this um, the in the poor the poor children the poor families had to enroll so the state would pay for them to attend school, but it told me their birth dates thirtieth of October eighteen thirty one and the fifth of July eighteen thirty four, so I quickly went back to my family records looked up the family of Levi who is a brother of of my great grandfather and sure enough there's Andy and Winnie listed in my family group record but no birth date for them. And I was like, oh my goodness, I, I can't believe this was here. So you just never know where you're gonna find as you start looking through these, these records by hand. Um, another uh, set of brothers that I ran across while I was scanning the pages for this name. So this was in 1859, and I can see that W.B. Dempsey and L.E. Dempsey, ages 22 and 18, were enrolled in school, and they were taking reading, writing, and arithmetic. And I was like, huh, well, that's pretty cool. They were a little bit older than the six-year-olds and the four-year-olds and the 10-year-olds they were attending school with, but they must have, for some reason, weren't able to go to school when they were younger and they wanted to learn these skills and um, had the opportunity to go to school. And I thought that was pretty cool that even as, as young men, they had this desire to learn because I don't think anyone was forcing an 18 or 22 year old to go to school in 1859. I, I, I believe this was a choice of theirs. And then I found them in the next record. They were still there learning spelling and reading in 1860. And so this led me to go, go to my Dempsey records. Well, who were W, B, and L, E? I want to figure out who they were. And I was able to find two brothers that were in that right age range. And one of them had a wife, no children. He, there was one census record for each of these boys. The 1860 census was, was associated with them. And that's all that was there. And um, I got really curious about this because I was like, well, that's kind of weird because, I mean, this family was, they, there were marriage records for them. And there was a marriage record for the oldest son, William, that WB. 
and there there were um, birth records for children, and you know, generally speaking, we can we could find stuff if if you looked a little bit. So I decided I decided to start looking. I was like, huh, eighteen and twenty two and eighteen and sixty. I wonder if these guys were involved in the Civil War. So I went to Fold Three, which is also a paid paid membership just for your information, um, but I was able to access it through the Family Search Library. And I found W.B. Dempsey and L.E. Dempsey in the Confederate um, records when I did a search for them. And I could see that, that the older brother, William, en enlisted in 1862, and his younger brother enlisted in August. So March of 1862 and August of 1862. And as I look down the report of, of this, of each of these boys, <clears throat> at the bottom, for William, it says, killed in action at the Battle of Chickamauga, September 19th, 1863. And I was like, ah, this is why there's no more records about him. His, his, his life came to an end not, not too long after, after he got married. And he was married in 1860 or 61, I think. And then enrolled in the, in the military and enlisted. And then he, he died at the Battle of Chickamauga. And I was like, oh, okay. And, and then came over here to his brother, Levi, L.E. says also Levi E. Dempsey. And I could see here that it also says he was captured in Richmond, Virginia, April 3rd, 1865, and died at the Jackson Hospital in Richmond, Virginia, April 15th, 1865. And if you know anything about the Civil War, the Civil War, um, came to an end in April of 1865 there um, near nearby Richmond. So from this, I learned that he was involved in one of the last battles of the Civil War, but unfortunately was captured and wounded and then consequently died um, at that hospital. And that answered the question I had about what, what happened to these guys? Didn't they get married and have kids and like all, the, all their brothers and sisters? And so I was able to, to then go to my records and enter some, some death dates and some information about, about their, um, their service in the military and, and the circumstances of their death. Um, I don't know that there are, well, I like to think that there aren't too many coincidences in life. And so I, if, you, if you kind of think back with me, I started out looking for, um, this one ancestor, who I wanted to look in the catalog for all the records in the county because I needed to find these specific school records, right? And this led me to finding these boys, learning more about them, entering their information onto my family tree. And about four or five months later, I was on a business trip that took me to the southeast of the United States. And I uh, was in North Carolina and South Carolina, Georgia, Alabama, and Tennessee on this trip, um, kind of driving around visiting some some different uh, manufacturing plants that I that I needed to to go take a look at for my for my work professional work, and um, I was I was with a coworker, and on this trip while we were driving through Georgia, I said, you know, um, Sarah, my my ancestry goes to this little town in Georgia, Cave Spring. And we've got about a day where we're just, it's just a driving day in between, you know, from Georgia to, I think we we're going to Alabama. I said, would, would you mind if we just kind of dipped down and visited this little town? And so we did. And I took some pictures and it was kind of fun to be in Cave Spring and, and see where all these ancestors that I've been doing research were, were, were from. And, and then uh, when we, and then we, the last place we were was in uh, Chattanooga, Tennessee. And while we were in Chattanooga, the, the, the water main in the city, or one of the water mains in the city broke and was flooding the city all over the place. Like our, like the air conditioning in the hotel didn't work. They didn't have food service. The, there's an aquarium in Chattanooga and that was, we, we, we had tickets to go to the aquarium that night after we were done with our business. And we weren't able to do any of that. We had to order food from across town so they could <laughs> bring it into us. And um, it was, it was, a fun experience, but the uh, chauffeur that was helping us out in the in the city that day 
he knew that we had tickets to go to this place. And he said, well, I can, I can drive you around if you want to do some sightseeing and, you know, cause your, your flight's not till tomorrow and there's really nothing going on in town. Um, they, they feel bad about that. And we're like, oh yeah, that'd be great. What are, what are some options? What are some things that we could do around here? He's listing a few things. He goes, and the, the Chickamauga battleground. And I was like, wait, what did you say? <laughs> he goes, Chickamauga battleground. I'm like, so, Sarah, do you mind going to a Civil War battle, battleground? No, oh, that would be interesting. So I, within months of finding this record that our family didn't have any, any knowledge of or records of, I was able to go visit this battleground where this brother had died. And it was such, like, it was, it was kind of surreal because I was just like, this was not even on my radar of things to do. But it... Finding the records and then being there in person, it just made that connection come together. And, and this is what doing family history is about. So searching by locations and going to locations, finding out about these people it can be so rewarding just personally um, and making connections with your family. And, and also it will enhance the story of their lives as you're gathering information about them. Um, I. I was able to look at military records and the oaths of allegiance was one of the items under military re records. And I wondered, what is that? So I clicked on that and it took me to all of these Dempseys that I found scrolling through the pages where after the civil war, they had to um, sign an oath of allegiance to the United States and that they were not loyal to the Confederacy. So these were just fascinating information to find. And these were all in the catalog underneath the category of that county. So hopefully you've learned a few things um, and get, maybe have some ideas of other kinds of records that you could look using these, these kinds of, of theories and thoughts. But we went over immigration and travel, how it can help using findagravenewspapers.com, the Family Search Wiki, and the catalog. That takes us to the end. If you have questions for me personally that you want to ask, you're welcome to email me at busby.missionary at gmail.com. And the presentation is available on my website. The, the link is in the chat several times, I believe now. And um, that's where the slides for this presentation are. Thank you.